All right, here we are, Paul Stetsowitz, the Weeks Aircraft, and we are going to talk about our future project that we pulled into the shop here this week, and that is the Messerschmitt 108. Uh, we just basically finished the Bucher Youngmeister. We're doing some work on our Stieglitz Falk with 44, and so we decided to kind of carry on with the German theme and hopefully do a nice restoration on our Messerschmitt 108. And if you're not familiar with the airplane, um, we'll give you a little bit of history of the 108 uh, in general. A lot of people are familiar with the Messerschmitt 109, which of course was the firm, uh, famous German fighter uh, from World War II. Uh, but the 108, of course, came before that, and it is a Willy Messerschmitt design. Um, but it was actually built by the Bavarian Aircraft Factory. This is actually before Messerschmitt was Messerschmitt, even though it was actually run by uh, Willy Messerschmitt. Uh, and basically, they designed this airplane not as a military aircraft, it was designed as a sport. Uh, airplane or touring aircraft. It's actually a four-seat airplane uh, and uh, basically like kind of the equivalent to a Cessna or a Bonanza uh, nowadays. And so they built and designed this wonderful airplane. Actually in 1935 was this airplane went into production and it was a very advanced airplane for its time frame because it was all metal construction although it does have fabric covered control services but the rest of the structure is completely uh, all metal. It has a Argus uh, 240 horsepower engine, which is also used in the Fiesel of Storch and, uh, and some other German aircraft. Very reliable, very, um, very good engine that we've had a lot of luck with. And it also came with a three different variations of propeller, either a fixed wooden propeller, which is on, on it right now, uh, a variable pitch, which was actually controlled by a little hand crank inside, or an air-driven controlled prop. It had a little, kind of a weird little spinner on the front of it that actually drove a controller that controlled the pitch of the propeller. Uh, when we finish this airplane, we're going to go with the with the hand adjustable uh, in the inside the airplane. Um, the extent basic construction is all metal. Um, very sleek design. I think this thing cruises or top speed is like around 200 miles an hour, which is which is pretty amazing. And the aircraft set all kinds of records. It won air races uh, during the war. Uh, it was just it was just hailed all over the place. It's just a, a very advanced airplane for its its time frame. Then of course, as it got closer to World War II, getting into high gear. Uh, 108s were pressed into service as liaison airplanes. Uh, in fact, some of them were built strictly as military airplanes. But our particular aircraft uh, was built as a civilian airplane. And it was built in Germany in 1938. And I point that out because uh, this airplane was built in a variety of places. They started out building their plane in Germany. Production was then moved into France uh, during the war and they continued to build the aircraft there. Then after the war was over, uh, the French thought it was such a wonderful design that they continued to build the airplane. But of course they ran out of Argus engines, so they had to re-engine it with a Renault French engine. And then they went on to do some other changes to it. It's actually a nose wheel version of the airplane, which at that point it's, it doesn't get very attractive. It gets a little bit ugly at that point. Um, but the true 108s uh, that, that everybody likes and are more valuable are the airplanes that are built in Germany and then this particular airplane was built at that point. Now interesting, some interesting history on it. Built in 38, this airplane actually ended up in South America, actually in Chile. And we're not sure how it got there or when it got there, um, but there of course there was a large German population uh, in Chile at the time, before and after the war. So somebody at some point imported the airplane into South America and it, at that time the logbook starts at in 1942. Now it had time on it prior to that. It had 350 hours prior to 1942. So we don't know if that time was flown in South America or if it was flown in Germany. It was eventually purchased by a gentleman named Otto Weiss, W-E-I-S, and he flew the airplane for a number of years. It flew from 1942 to 1958 and the airplane has approximately 856 hours on the airframe from what the logbooks show us. A very complete logbook that has a lot of great information. Uh, eventually, at some point, we don't really know how, but there was a gentleman from the United States by the name of David Snyder who lived in Miami. If there's anybody out there that knows somebody about this person or has a family member, we'd like to actually talk to somebody to get some more information. He found out about the airplane and he went to South America and he purchased the aircraft from Otto. And he 
imported the airplane into the United States. And this was 1982. Unfortunately, after only having the airplane for a little while, uh, not even a year, he passed away. And the family had the airplane, they lost interest in the airplane because it was kind of David's dream, I guess, to build the airplane. So the airplane went up for sale and they placed an ad and trade a plane and that's where Kermit saw the airplane. And this is way back and he purchased the airplane from um, the Snyder family. And we've had it in storage ever since. Uh, it was down in Miami, we transported it up to, to this facility, it was across the street for a number of years. And every time I would go across the street in storage and look at the airplane, I would just, just drool over the airplane because it's just a fascinating little airplane. And what's really fascinating about this aircraft is that it is, is an 80 years old, 1938, it's uh, 2018 now, an 80 year old airplane. And the originality of this airplane is just astonishing. Uh, a lot of these airplanes, as time progresses, especially over an eight-year period, there have been multiple changes to the airplanes, damage, m modifications, all kinds of strange things we've seen to airplanes that, that, that have been done to these, these projects. But this airplane has survived basically untouched. There are a few modifications which we're going to talk about that were done. but. May, other than that though, it still retains like 100% of its originality, which is just fascinating uh, to look at. And it's actually a little bit sad because we're going to look at the airplane and you're going to see how it survived and how original it is. And it's, it's great that it's that way, but then of course to restore this airplane, to make it fly and make it safe, we have to tear the entire airplane apart and do a full restoration, which we're excited about. But on the flip side, it's a little sad because this is the last time you will see the airplane look this way. Uh, it has all this great patina on it. It's not the original paint. It's been painted over uh, two or three times. But still, it's, 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 it's almost a shame that you can't just leave it like this and, and, and display it. But if you did that, of course, you couldn't fly it because it's unsafe the way it is. The paint's fallen off of it. Control services need recovered. Engine needs overhauled. All the wiring is bad in the airplane. Plexiglass is all bad. Um, but it's just a great opportunity to look at an airplane uh, unrestored and a lot of airplanes we get don't look like this. A good example of that is the Stenson L1. It, 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 was, it was actually a pleasure to tear that airplane apart because there was so many modifications and it was so unoriginal it didn't really matter. Uh, but this airplane uh, is a little bit different than that. So we're going to be very careful when we take the airplane apart. We're going to document everything uh, very carefully so we make sure uh, that we put it back together uh, correctly and make, of course, make everybody happy, make Kermit happy, and of course, make the Germans happy because they look at this airplane, of course, as a part of their history. We don't want to do anything uh, to modify the airplane to make it um, too American or too English. Uh, so we're going to keep real authentic uh, to the design uh, and the originality of the airplane. All right, so we're going to start talking about uh, some details about this airplane, and a lot of people ask us when we're doing a restoration, well, where do you start? What do you do? What's kind of the starting point of the airplane? What I like to do is I like to kind of do an evaluation of the airplane, kind of take an overall look of it, and that kind of gives us a better idea and a plan as to going forward on the airplane. So that's actually what we're going to do. We're kind of going to walk through and kind of show you not only some cool things about the airplane, but also some concerns and some plans we have uh, for the restoration. Uh, of course, starting at the front, uh, we have the, uh, the Argus engine. Now this is the original engine that came with the aircraft. It does still rotate. And what's interesting, it's an electric start uh, airplane, but it's also if you're battering with that and you, and you had to start a different way, it's actually a hand crank start. And it has a, a little uh, starter that goes in here and you just turn it and you can see it turns the prop. At the same time, the little clicking noise you hear is a little impulse coupling in the mags, uh, which it gets it going. So, uh, pretty neat that the original handles with the airplane, that all, that all still works. Um, this particular engine though, since we don't know the history of it, uh, we're probably going to replace it. Um, Kermit, when he bought the Feastler Storch, which we've had in the collection for many years, which is also Argus powered, the same people that built that airplane, did the restorations, actually overhauled the engine and Kermit actually had them overhaul another engine and we'll show you that a little bit later. And that's the engine we're probably going to put on this airplane just so to save us a little bit of time. Also, you'll notice that the cowling is off the airplane. The original cowling, most of it, was actually made of magnesium skins. A lot, the Germans like to use a lot of magnesium in some of their skins. Um, the cowling was in pretty poor condition, but we got very fortunate. There was somebody in England that was looking to convert a 108 from a Renault-powered airplane to an Argus, and they didn't have a cowling. Kermit's cowling was a good pattern. We sent that to them. And in return for them sending it as a pattern, uh, Kermit said, that's fine, but you have to make us a whole new cowling. 
And so we actually have a completely manufactured cowling, which we'll show you a little bit later. So, but that's why the cowling is also we're excited about that. It's going to save us a lot of it, a lot of time. Also, the propeller, the propeller that it's on right now is the fixed pitch wooden. This airplane had the adjustable uh, variable pitch, but has a controller inside for that. Um, the airplane came with that propeller. It was also in bad shape, but then again, there was somebody in Germany that was trying to recreate that prop. They didn't have anything to go by. Kermit sent that prop to a company called MT Propellers. They used that prop as a, a, a prototype or a guide to make new props, and in return, they built him a new prop. So we have an overhauled engine, we have a new cowling, and we have a brand new overhauled prop. So again, save us a lot of time. It's going to be great. It's going to have to, don't have to do a lot of research. It's going to speed up things. As we kind of move uh, towards the fuselage of the airplane, um, you'll see that the airplane is uh, plexiglass covering. Um, and amazingly enough, I actually found uh, a plexiglass company in Pennsylvania. I'm not quite sure why they had the molds, but they actually had the molds to make new plexiglass. They must have produced it for somebody at some point. Uh, found out about the company, contacted them. Uh, they made us a whole new set of glass for the airplane. Uh, again, I think it's going to save us a lot of time. So that's all going to come off and get redone. Uh, it's got little sliding windows on it, but the coolest thing, probably one of the coolest features of this airplane is how you get in it. Uh, it has two big clamshell doors that open up. And there's a little latch here. And these doors just fold all the way back. And they hit a little rubber bumper here. And that's access to the airplane. It's just, it's just beautiful. The other side does the same thing. And it's just easy to get in and out. Very unique to the airplane. It still retains its original sun shades, which are just amazing. They're actually, it's too bad we can't reuse them, but there's some of them are torn, but they're going to be a good pattern to use when we make new ones. The rope on the door here is when you're sitting in the airplane, you can grab a hold of the door and open and close it without slamming it against the side of the fuselage. Again, original, all intact on the airplane. Uh, the interior of the airplane, like I said, it's a four place aircraft. Extremely comfortable leather seats. This is like the sports car of the sky. This is like, it's like a combination of an airplane and a sports car. Uh, the seats are in pretty rough shape. Uh, leather is torn. Uh, they actually have feather filling inside of them. The feathers are all flying out of them. So of course the seats will come out. Uh, and when those will go find a good upholstery shop that, uh, that does that kind of work and send all that and, and get redone. Inside the airplane, it retains most of its original instruments, although there are a few changes in there because, of course, this airplane flew in South America, so there are a few instruments that were labeled uh, in Spanish, so it could be flown legal there. I'm sure it was a requirement at the time, but basically the instrument panel is, is untouched. It's got a couple of American instruments in it. I'm not quite sure why uh, those were added, um, but other than that, again, untouched airplane. You don't see that very often. Uh, the floor inside the airplane, all the electrics are still in it, all the plumbing is still in it. It's a good guide to go by. And all the carpeting is in the airplane. It has a full set of carpeting and it's all there. Now it's all pretty in rough shape, but it's all there for us to use as a pattern to send to a company that can reproduce that. So that again is also amazing. One of the most interesting facts, not only is the, of the, of the way the doors open, but it's the landing gear on the airplane. It's a retractable gear aircraft but it is not hydraulic, it is mechanical. It has a ratcheting handle in between the two seats and you actually flip a switch for up or down and you run this handle back and forth and it actually brings the gear up and down. No hydraulics, the only thing hydraulic on the airplane are the brakes. Flaps are also mechanical. So real simple, nothing to brake, easier plane to work on. So of course the plan for this part is to remove all this change the plexiglass, have the seats redone, instruments will come out, sent out for overhaul. Uh, some of this work as far as parts and some of the instrument overhaul and a few other things we may actually have to send to Germany. I uh, work with a guy named Dirk Bend. If you're watching Dirk, thanks for all the help. He's actually helped with, with some other projects that we're doing here. And he's a good source for information, for parts, because uh, a lot of that is hard to find in the United States because it is a foreign airplane. It is all metric. <clears throat> all the hardware in the airplane is metric, um, but that's easily obtainable. That's not too much of an issue. And most of the hardware that's in it is actually probably reusable after we replayed it. Uh, as we move back to the airplane, uh, you see where the wings attach right here. Another interesting feature of the 108, of the civilian 108s, are is that the wings fold. After you're done flying it, you don't have a large hanger to store this in, you actually pull a little lever and undoes the two, two little pins that lock right here. You pull the wing out a little bit and it rotates right here 
and you can fold the wing up against the side of the fuselage. So not only is it small in general, but you can actually, if you don't have a lot of room to store, you can actually roll this thing inside of your garage and store the airplane there. So again, another interesting uh, fact. It still retains a lot of its German uh, stenciling. I think this has to do with um, folding the wings and some of it's got painted over here, but that is all pretty much intact. We'll be able to take photographs of that and measure all that so we can uh, produce all that back onto the airplane. As we move further back, you'll see again some of the fairings on it, magnesium skins back here, which in, th in this case are actually in very good condition, so we're very lucky there. Uh, and then back to the baggage compartment. Now here uh, is where they made a modification to the airplane, which is unfortunate that they did this, but the, the Messerschmitt 108 doesn't have a lot of fuel. It doesn't hold that much fuel. It has five tanks. I forget what the total capacity is at this time. So whoever owned this airplane, they were trying to get some more range out of it. So in the baggage compartment, they added a fuel tank to the airplane. A little lap there. And it's, it's probably about seven, eight gallons there, which would give you a little, quite a bit more range there. But unfortunately, when they did this modification, they drilled into the floor of the luggage compartment I did a couple other things that are, you know, just not very neat. So that's going to come out and get put back original. And we might have to actually rebuild the floor because the floor is pretty chewed up. There's a big hole board in the bottom of the floor. And another thing they did is they moved the battery into the baggage compartment, which is also very strange because they only, not only did they put a fuel tank in the baggage compartment, they put the battery in the baggage compartment, which is not the safest thing to do. And when they did that, of course, they drilled more holes and pulled the cables up into there and stuck it in there. And of course, it reduces the storage uh, of the baggage compartment with all that. So that's all going to have to come out and put, be put back originally. One of the other concerns we have on the airplane are the skins. Uh, this area right here has, somebody must have been leaning up against this at some point, but you can see this area is, is oil can right here. Somebody did a little reinforcement repair behind that. Um, unfortunately, you can't just repair this section. You can't just replace the skin. The 108 is like the Messerschmitt 109 in that the skin is part of the structure of the, of the, of the former and the, and the bulkhead in here. It was all stamped or stretch formed at the same time. Uh, so this whole piece of skin goes from the center all the way around to here and to remake that piece would be pretty involved. They've done that for the 109, um, but it's extremely costly and nobody's done it for the 108. So any damage here, we might actually just have to do a repair uh, to deal with that right there. Fuel tank access is through this hole right here. Uh, this hole right here is a little uh, plug for APU. Uh, if you need to stick your batteries dead, you need to stick in a, a plug in there for external power. And then again, uh, going back to the tail, you see all the overlapping skins, all flush riveted. That's what made this airplane so fast. Uh, then you can see the old the old chili uh, markings on it, CCPWA, which is the uh, original uh, registration for it that's in the log books. There were also two other registrations for the airplane in South America, so I believe somebody else owned the airplane prior to uh, Otto owning the airplane. And then going back a little bit further, uh, you'll see the, in all pretty much in good condition, but uh, right here on both sides there's a, there's a hole. Now there's supposed to be a hole here, because that's where the strut goes to support the horizontal stabilizer. But for some reason, this all got tore out on both sides. Now, the good thing there is that this skin here probably can be replaced. It's not one of these special skins up here. We think we can just drill this off and reproduce this piece uh, and put it back the way it was. The tail uh, vertical horizontal stabilizer here uh, is adjustable. It had a control wheel in the cockpit that you can actually adjust the angle and the rudder is conventional along with the vertical fin, which are also in very good shape. One of the things we're trying to determine on this airplane is how it might have been painted originally. Um, these airplanes, especially civilian, were painted either in three different colors. They were either like a blue, a cream color, or a gray. Uh, of course, this airplane appears cream. Somebody had painted it over in South America, but there are remnants of this uh, lighter cream color which we're not sure if that's original. We thought maybe that was initially, but then as we started looking closer at the plane, there's all these little areas of this blue color, which I believe is uh, RLM uh, 47. It's a German, I think it's a German color. We're not sure if that was the original color of the airplane when it came from the factory or if it was something that was applied in South America. And there's also some yellow on the airplane, on the wings, and we're trying to scrape away the paint very carefully in a few areas 
to see uh, what that's going to produce. But again, we're trying to find some history of the airplane, and we don't want to just dive into it and just strip all the paint off of it and hope that uh, you know we find all the information. We have to do this very carefully. Now, what's interesting is every time I went across the street to look at the airplane, the paint was falling off of it very slowly. And I think if I would have left the airplane across the street for another five years, it would have stripped itself. Because <laughs> it would just piles of paint underneath the airplane. And also inside the airplane too, the paint's flaking away. So of course, it should be a fairly easy airplane to, to strip because like I said, most of the paint is, uh, paint is just uh, falling off the aircraft. So again, it, there's the fuselage. Um, in very good shape. A couple of concerns we have here and there, but nothing uh, that we don't think we can take care of. And the next thing we're going to go on to uh, is to show you the wings.